good afternoon and thank you for joining us on this webinar, Learning from Our Peers, Tobacco-Free College Case Studies. Uh, happy to be with you this afternoon. This is Sarah and I'm with my colleague Meg from the um, Breathe Easy Coalition of Maine. Before we jump into the webinar, we just want to go over a few logistics. Um, just letting you know that all participants will be muted throughout the presentation and we'll be answering questions at the end of the webinar, but we don't want to lose those burning questions from you, um, so you can enter them in at any time uh, through the question box and the go to webinar task bar. And so that'll be a way that we'll collect those and answer them at the end. We also wanted to make sure that you knew that we're recording this webinar and we'll give an opportunity to find this on our archive channel so you can uh, share with colleagues or look back at something. Um, and it'll be recorded and archived on our Breathe Easy Coalition YouTube channel, which is youtube.com slash sfhousing. Um, and give that at least probably about a week to have that arrive there. Um, we'll also send it out to everyone who registered for the webinar. But you can also find other past webinars from the Coalition on that site. So just quickly want to give you an overview of what we're going to talk about during this webinar. Uh, we're going to go over a little bit about the coalition, just some background, give a general case for addressing tobacco, talk about our case study portfolio project, um, as well as the lessons learned from those pieces working with um, college campuses here in Maine and their stories, then share some advice for implementing tobacco-free college campus policies, talk about additional resources that Br the Breathe Easy Coalition has, and then answer any questions and provide our contact information. So to begin, we want to give you a little bit of background in case you're not familiar with the Breathe Easy Coalition. We're a statewide organization in Maine working to reduce exposure to secondhand smoke through the development of strong voluntary policies that lead to reduced tobacco use and increased tobacco-free living across the state of Maine. The coalition works in four key environments, behavioral health facilities, hospitals, multi-unit housing, and related to today's webinar, colleges and universities. And we are able to do this work with funding and support by the Maine CDC Partnership for Tobacco-Free Maine. So to jump into the background components of our webinar, why do we want to see tobacco-free campus policies adopted? There's really a great case for it that um, has been built that shows us why it's so important to be addressing tobacco and the evidence base for doing so through policy. So to start out with um, some key components that have, that have come out as some key talking points, we know that tobacco use remains the leading cause of preventable disease and death in the United States. And unfortunately, the vast majority of tobacco users begin early, and 98% start before the age of 26. So this is why that college age of starting around 18, where in most places it's still legal to buy tobacco products, before, and that 18 to 24-year-old young adult range is so important to be having strong social norming around tobacco-free environments. And we know that these uh, tobacco-free policies, implementing them, including on your college campus, does change the social norm around tobacco use and promotes tobacco-free lifestyles. Um, and so it's a great opportunity to really impact that and continue on that work. Also, from an environmental standpoint, which can be a really great talking point when uh, working with certain audiences on your college campus, is that there is the, a litter issue. And cigarette butts continue to be the most littered item in the United States. And as we go uh, delve deeper into this in a minute, you'll see even more sort of data about, about that harm and how that can impact your cost and appearance of your university. We know that there's no safe level of exposure to secondhand smoke. Um, and the Surgeon General has put out multiple um, reports on this and has stated that even brief exposure can cause damage that can lead to serious disease and death. So creating a tobacco-free environment will protect everyone from those harmful effects of secondhand smoke, including the thousands of chemicals, at least 69 of which are known to cause cancer in humans in the um, from that on your campus. 
Also, we get a lot of questions regarding the outdoor environment and having that smoke-free and tobacco-free campus. We know that addressing secondhand smoke, um, that there have been multiple studies that showing it poses a significant health, health risk in outdoor settings, and research has found that smoking within 20 feet of a non-smoker can cause harmful levels of exposure that can be as high outside as they are in indoor settings. So that's why it's important to expand that policy out beyond just your indoor buildings or what might be covered by state law um, to protect people when they're walking to and from buildings on your campus, as well as supporting that social norm. When we talk about smoke and tobacco-free policies, it's really important to remember that we're going beyond just the traditional combustible cigarettes um, and smoke tobacco products. There are a lot of additional products um, that we know are harmful and should be included in your policy. We also know that there is great social norming and use that is happening of, of some of these products, including electronic cigarettes and electronic nicotine delivery systems. This covers sort of that broad group of emerging products that you'll see with some of the, the image here, uh, like such as e-cigarettes, vaporizers, vape pens, hookah pens, and e-pipes. E um, so, and unfortunately we're seeing that they're gaining a lot of popularity amongst youth and young adults, and these products can lead to strong nicotine addiction and negative health, health impacts. Um, so you want to make sure you're including these products in your policy because also of the fact that we're seeing this popping up as, as something that um, youth are turning to before traditional tobacco products, so we don't want to see them end up with that nicotine addiction. Because we've learned from the fact that there is no safe tobacco product, that's what the Surgeon General has stated, um, and nicotine is addictive in any form. So once that nicotine addiction goes into place, we really want to um, know how hard it can be for people to quit. So we want to make sure that we're, we're reducing that. Also related to uh, these emerging tobacco products and electronic nicotine delivery systems, we are still tr trying to learn more about what's happening, but we know that the vapor from these products that they release um, can include nicotine and other cancer-causing chemicals. So it's not just a harmless water vapor um, and sort of can should be included along those policies for the same reasons as secondhand smoke. As I mentioned earlier, that cigarette butts are the most littered item in the United States, and actually they make up nearly 38% of all collected litter in this country. And nearly all cigarettes um, so actually about 98% have a plastic, non-biodegradable filter, um, which also includes additional toxins that can leach out into the ground and water. So these are products that this is a really important component of adopting your tobacco-free policy is to reduce your environmental impact and uh, the litter component. But also we worked with campuses in the state of Maine that have seen a large increase, decrease in the amount of funding that they're having to spend on campus litter pickup because they're not having to clean up cigarette butts as much. So to highlight really the impact of addressing tobacco on your campus, the previous few slides have been really the generic components, the big pieces, but why, why target colleges and universities? Why does this fit into your role? Um, the great thing is that it will reduce exposure to secondhand smoke for students, employees, and visitors. It supports that healthy social norms that don't include using tobacco. It will increase the number of tobacco users who quit and support those who are trying to quit. It will reduce the initiation of tobacco use among young people and show your commitment to a healthy environment. So there's a great winning uh, connection here to be able to pull these all together. And the nice thing to know if you're on a college campus that's considering going tobacco free, you're not alone. This is starting to happen across the country. It's a, a really exciting thing. Um, nationally, with numbers that get from the Americans for Nonsmokers Rights, they've collected that over 1,100 college and, colleges and universities have 100% tobacco free campus policies, and more than 800 of those have policies that include the electronic nicotine delivery systems. And Maine colleges and universities are doing great work to adopt tobacco-free campuses. 
Um, and we've now seen 22 out of 27 colleges and universities in the state adopt tobacco-free campus policies. And you'll see on this great map that Meg put together showing how much they really do stretch from each edge of the state of Maine um, on adopting those. And with that component, I'm going to turn it over to her to talk about some of the more specific examples. Thank you, Sarah. So getting really into the meat of our webinar, with our campus case study portfolio. Um, this was a project that came out of grant funding from the Maine Cancer Foundation um, and was kind of written as a broad, let's do these case study portfolios. So we were, I was, I came on board and was able to take this project and run with it, which was really exciting, with the goal being to provide insight into the process of adopting and the process of enforcing um, smoke and tobacco free campus policies at various schools across the state. So we released this portfolio, I think earlier this year, um, earlier in 2016, spring. this spring, um, with an initial feature of four schools which included Colby College in Waterville, which is a private four-year institution um, in the central part of the state, Kennebec Valley Community College, which is a state-funded community college, um, actually not far from where Colby is, St. Joseph's College, which is a private four-year institution in the southern part of the state, and then the University of Maine, which is the flagship university campus for the University of Maine system in Orono and is the single large campus um, in the state of Maine. For those of you who are familiar with Maine, we are roughly 1.2 million people in the state and most of our colleges and universities fall within like the D3 school size and are small minus the University of Maine which is our largest campus that has close to 11,000 students enrolled. So we picked these four campuses because of varying campus size um, both physically and within the student body, varying geographic locations, the different types of school, and then the policy adoption process. We're lucky here with the Breathe Easy Coalition in our initiative of the Maine Tobacco Free College Network to have had some insight knowledge as to how these, process, how these policies were adopted among various campuses in the state, which allowed us to kind of say, hey, you know, this is how it happened at this school, so let's be able to feature that and other things like that. Um, and we are also excited to say that we have more schools that will be added to this portfolio soon. Um, we have two school portfolio, um, two school case studies that are finished, and I just need to add them to the online resource, which you'll notice over the next few slides of the webinar that the web link at the bottom of this is how you would access the case study portfolio right on our website. Um, so we have two schools that are completed, and I need to add those to the online resource. And then I have, we are, have two interviews scheduled with two additional schools um, later this month. So we'll have four new schools added to this portfolio by the end of the year. Again, with varying campus size, um, school type, and policy process, which is really exciting to us. So let's jump into it. So. Um, on each of the case studies, we asked the schools very similar questions so that we could really paint a broad picture as to what the process was like among varying schools. So we're going to highlight each of those different questions um, and have picked a different school to feature. So the first one is St. Joseph's College, which is a small um, private school in southern Maine. So their process to adopting a policy, their university president, announced in February 2013 that the college went, would transition to a tobacco-free campus. Um, but prior to that, there had been a lot of dialogue on campus for some time about changing the policy. It was kind of an interesting story when I went there. So for all of these, I went to these college campuses and interviewed people in person, recorded our conversations, took pictures on campus um, to really get that personal story. These were all done in person. So I was lucky enough at St. Joe's to uh, interview Jenna Chase, who is their wellness coordinator on campus. She is also an alum of St. Joseph's College, and she spent time doing her student internship in the spring of her senior year researching tobacco-free campus policies, what had, where things were in the state of Maine and throughout New England, and at the time there were not a lot of schools, um, so she wasn't able to provide a lot of information back to the president and the, like, the bigger committee on the um, college campus, but it was still something that the school was having those conversations, you know, starting at least in 2010. So they're a few year process for them. Um, once this announcement was made by St. Joe's president, um, the 
College formed a tobacco-free campus committee that had representatives from 12 different departments across campus um, and utilized, they utilized a seven month period to fully implement their policy, which provided them maximum success once they went to that actual tobacco free date um, and have had a lot of buy in from their campus community. So the next question we asked all of our schools was the driving force behind the policy. So this we were trying to get at, you know, what was that thing that made the school want to adopt this policy? Um, and actually featuring here is one of our new schools that's not yet added to the online resource, which is Northern Maine Community College, which is in Presque Isle, which is Northern Maine. So if you remember back a few slides ago to the map of the state of Maine, this is there within, a, I would say, miles of the Canadian border. So northern part of the state, very rural. Um, so at Northern Maine, their president wanted to adopt a tobacco-free campus policy in conjunction with the opening of the new Smith Wellness Center on campus, which is a brand new wellness facility on this campus, which is a huge resource to this very small community college campus. Um, and to be able to move forward with this on their own timeline, because at the same time when Northern Maine Community College was discussing this policy change, there was a representative in the state legislature that had proposed a bill um, within that session for the state to, that would prohibit the use of, um, it would have required all publicly funded colleges and universities, so all of our university college, all of our university system schools and all of our community colleges to adopt the smoke and tobacco free campus policy. Um, at the time, not all of the universities and colleges in Maine had that. Um, it was conversations were happening on a lot of campuses, but in this case, this school said, hey, you know, this is a a possibility that we're going to be forced to have to do this. Let's get out in front of it and be able to do this on our own timeline versus having to fall within that state timeline. Uh, it turned out that the just the proposal of this bill within the state legislature was enough to push the last few state funded universities and colleges in Maine uh, to do this policy adoption process on their own schedule. So the representative who proposed this actually withdrew this bill, which we in the public health community saw as a really exciting thing. One of the next questions we asked was what products are included in the policy? Because as you'll remember from earlier in the webinar, as Sarah stated, you know, more than 1,100 schools in the country have these tobacco-free campus policies. And of those, you know, over 800 have e-cigarettes. So from a broad public health perspective, we want all tobacco products included. Um, if you actually look at the American for Non-Smokers Rights data numbers, the numbers of schools with just smoke-free campus policies is actually even higher than that 1,100. Um, so for this question, what products are included? We actually found pretty much the exact same answer from all of the schools we have interviewed in the state. And I think part of that comes from the work we do here at the Breathe Easy Coalition to work with schools and help them update their policies so that they are meeting best practice standards for covering all tobacco products. So Kennebec Valley Community College prohibits the use of all tobacco products or any object or device intended to simulate that use, including e-cigarettes. And this language comes word for word out of their tobacco-free campus policy. Um, so KVCC actually had a 100% smoke-free campus policy in the late 90s, which is super early um, for them to be doing that. And they were the first school in Maine to adopt 100% tobacco-free campus policy in 2006. Um, they were followed shortly thereafter by a number of schools, but we like to highlight them because they had this policy adopted four years before some other schools. Mm -hmm. Um, and to show that they actually had to revise their policy over the years to maintain a comprehensive approach to banning these new products as they come out. Because when they passed their policy in 2006, e-cigarettes weren't a thing that most people knew of, especially here in Maine. I feel like we're a little, we're a little rural up here in this part of the country, <laughs> so maybe some of these new emerging things take a few years for them to get here. Um, but it is something that we have heard schools say, you know, do what you can now and then move forwards as you can. So and then the big question that we always get from a lot of schools and even as we get people reaching out to us here in Maine from other states is, you know, what is this going to cost me? I mean, we hear it not even just in the college and university world, but in other, um, the other initiative areas that we work with. 
people are always worried about how much it's going to cost. So we asked all of the schools what was the cost associated. So here from Colby College, their only cost was for signage and door decals, which you can see the two pictures of there. So the door decal on the left is hard to see because of the brick behind it. Um, and then their tobacco-free campus signage was actually, they modified the existing signage they had on campus. So the picture on the right there at the very bottom, it's really hard to see because the background of their sign is black, but up close in person, that bottom piece that says a tobacco-free campus is a separate piece of material from the existing sign. So they were able to just retrofit these pieces so that they look like they've always been part of their signage. They weren't, um, which allowed them to keep their costs minimal. Um, and then other information as they did their policy implementation was posted on the website, was sent out in campus communication, which are things that the that college is doing anyways, so there's no added costs for them to add that language. Um, all of the schools that I have visited so far, so the four that were in the initial release and the two that I have interviewed since, um, have all said the exact same thing, that the only costs have been for signage. A lot of schools have been able to roll it into, you know, capital campaign projects for the university or an ongoing beautification process. Um, as a former university employee of a school here in Maine, it was an easy sell on that campus to say, you know, you're in this process of rebranding, you know, there was a university logo change, you have to change all your signage anyways, now's the time to do this when you can just add that cost in. So it has, really the cost has not been a prohibiting factor for a lot of schools. I would say one of the next biggest questions that we get from schools is how do we enforce this? You know, a great policy on paper is one thing, but we want to hear from schools that they're actually enforcing these policies. So, here we'll feature from the University of Maine. Their policy, so this first line here is word for word from their campus policy and policy website that says it's the shared responsibility of all UMaine community members to respect and abide by the policy. Administrators, deans, directors, department chairs, supervisors, and event sponsors are all tasked with communicating the policy within their areas of responsibility. Signage is posted around campus, and the policy is communicated in appropriate university publications, handbooks, brochures, and in all vendor contracts. So when I went to the University of Maine and was interviewing their campus regarding this, you know, it was something that we talked about that they hold their venues that they have on campus where they allow the general public to come in and rent a space. Um, when they sign a contract for that, there is a disclosure line in there that says, you know, we're a tobacco-free campus. And you holding your event here on our campus need to communicate that to the people that are attending your event and make sure that they abide by it. Here's where they need to travel from whatever building you're in on campus to get off campus if they so choose to use tobacco. Um, the individual I spoke with at UMaine had also said that it's uh, included their tobacco free campus statements included it on all of their electronic signboards at the football games um, with UMaine being one of our big flagship schools, you know, there's a lot of hundreds of people that will attend a football game or hockey event. Um, these things are on their big electronic signboards at the very beginning or made announcements over the public PA system at sporting events or other concerts or things like that. So it's a, it can be an easy addition to things that are already being done at a lot of these events on campus um, for schools to be able to help communicate their policy. And a majority of people, when there's a sign up around that says this is a tobacco-free area, a vast majority of people are going to abide by that. So getting it, those are the big questions that we asked in this portfolio. If you go to the online resource, you'll see some of the other questions. Um, the final two questions on the second page we asked of each school were very uh, opinion-based of the individual that I spoke to. Um, which we actually think can make the most compelling argument for you on your campus to bring back to say, hey, you know what, this is somebody who, who is from a school who has done this. All of these schools um, have had their policies in place for at least a few years, which is exciting to us. Um, I should actually backtrack and say, if you go to the online resource, you'll notice at the beginning of each case study is the demographics around the school. So the type of school, the campus size in terms of acres, numbers of student body, and then when the policy went into effect and who I spoke to. 
Um, so some of the advice these schools had for other schools um, from St. Joe's, they had said, don't reinvent the wheel. Reach out to schools who have already gone tobacco-free and ask them questions. And this is something I think we see a lot of here in Maine, which is really exciting because we're a small state and a small community. Chances are if you work at one college or university in the state, you know people who, if you don't yourself, you know people at your school who know people at another school that are already tobacco-free. And it, it makes this nice network of people to be able to reach out. Um, from the University of Maine, they said there was a lot of best practice information readily available, both here in the state of Maine and across the country. You know, we know that some of you on this webinar today are not from Maine, and we are more than happy to share the information and resources that we have with you. We're excited that you're on this webinar for us to be able to share what we've learned here for you to take back to your schools in your states. Um, so using information that's already available can help move the process along so you don't have to start from scratch. It's kind of that same piece of what St. Joseph said. And ask questions of other schools. They can share their experiences. This is part of why we've put together these case studies because sometimes it's really hard for school officials to talk to other school officials. People are busy. Um, so it's an, an advantage for us to have this resource for people to read and also to have recorded this webinar today. Um, from Kennebec Valley Community College, this piece I think is it really spoke to me when I heard them say it is she had said build your policy around what you can do at the time while you're working on it and then develop as you're developing the policy and then keep adjusting as you go. This is how it can be the most successful and create community support. So this speaks to KVCC how they adopted their policy in the early 90s. It was just smoke free. They amended it in 2006 to be tobacco free and since 2006 they've amended it to add electronic cigarettes and pieces like this. So they're constantly evolving their policy as need be with the buy-in from their campus community. Um, and then from Colby, they had wise words to say as well, you know, ultimately the policy is out of the care and the best interest for the community. It's not restriction for the sake of restriction and communicating the values behind the policy, being clear it's a value-driven proposition can help. Um, I know we we hear from schools or from students on schools that say, you can't do this, this is my right, I'm allowed to do this. Um, and people feeling like you're just telling me this is one other thing I can't do on my campus. And if you, if your communication prior to the policy being adopted and enacted is clearly communicated, you know, using all the talking points that Sarah had previously mentioned around there being no safe level of exposure to secondhand smoke or no safe tobacco products, there's so many arguments that say this is we're not doing this just to say you can't do this. We're doing this for a health perspective, um, which is really why we encourage smoke and tobacco free policy that it's all smoking products, all tobacco products. Then we're, it's not just about the smoke or the smoker. I mean, it's not about the smoker. It's about the smoke. Mm -hmm. It's about the tobacco. It's about the health hazards of these products. So that kind of concludes the bigger picture of the advice from the individual schools that we're going to highlight right now, but we want to make sure that we share with you all all of the other resources that we have at the Breathe Easy Coalition with our main tobacco-free college network initiative. So on your screen right now is a screenshot of our website for the main tobacco-free college network, which is maintobaccofreecollegenetwork.org. Long <laughs> web URL, but it's super easy to get there. Um, we have a lot of resources available on that website including, as we go here, so available for download, we have our Smoke and Tobacco Free Campus Toolkit, which is a actual multi-page, um, on our website it's actually available for download in sections because the file itself was too big for us to upload the entire toolkit all at once, but if you would like a printed copy, we can definitely mail one to you. Um, so this toolkit contains sample policy language, talking points, an implementation timeline, you know, all of these bigger picture things that should be considered when you're looking at adopting a tobacco-free, smoking tobacco-free campus. Um, on our website is also this video vignette project that was done a few years ago that um, it's kind of a, it's a video story similar mm -hmm. to these case studies that we're doing now that you know, in a couple minutes, interviews a few people at a few different campuses across Maine that talk about what it was like on their campus. Um, we have infographics around smoke and tobacco-free uh, college campuses. We have infographics on secondhand smoke, third-hand smoke. Um, coming soon, we will have some information on e-cigarettes and hookah, which is a big 
Um, we're hearing from college campuses that this is a new, it's not new, it's a fancy thing that college students are using a lot more. Um, so infographics, which are all of ours are like a five by eight size if you were to print it out. Um, they're visually appealing, lots of data points and really succinct information. We have fact sheets that have a lot more information in more detail. Um, and then the rack cards as well, and recordings to our webinars, this one today, as well as previous webinars. And as I noted, if you would like a printed copy of any of the materials that are on our website that you can't download, I know all of the Campus Toolkit pieces, most of them I believe are available as PDF and for the ones that are templates, you can, excuse me, download Word documents of those. So you can kind of just take it and cut it and paste it and use what you need. Um, we're happy to be able to provide those resources to people. And again, there's the web URL right there on the screen. Awesome. Thanks so much, Meg, for all of those great resources and the stories from, from all of the different campuses, because I think it's really exciting to hear it uh, uh, directly from them as to what works, and so we can, can build on that. Um, this is the time we know we've shared a lot of information with you, but want to make sure that you don't uh, leave the webinar with any burning questions. Um, and so wanted to take that chance, make sure to write those out into the uh, question bar here if you if you have any, uh, but also to make sure that people know our, how to reach us, how to connect with the coalition. Um, as you'll see on here, we've got email and phone numbers, as well as the website that uh, Meg mentioned, MainTobaccoFreeCollegeNetwork.org, or if you're interested in other general information or how to reach out to um, the coalition or get, get information on some of our other initiatives around housing, behavioral health, or hospitals, you can go to BreatheEasyMain.org. Um, also, we love social media. So we try to make sure as, I mean, as we talk about tobacco-free policies as a social norm, I think it's really important to also be sharing what's happening um, around the state and around the country um, on that. So we try to make sure that we're utilizing all of the different um, platforms as a way to connect there. Uh, so if you've got something going on or you're curious about other campuses going tobacco free, we'll share that information. So you can find us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, um, hitting on those pieces, then our YouTube channel that is focused on um, sharing past presentations and webinars, as well as those video vignettes. So with that, we want to open it up for questions uh, to see if there are any. So please feel free to write those in. Um, that I'll well, ask the, the first one, actually is a good one for, for Meg, is is it possible for my campus to be included in the case study project? That is a great question. Um, if you are from a school here in the state of Maine, we would love to be able to come and interview you or whoever is the correct person on your college or university campus to be featured in our um, case study portfolio. I think we we love all the success that's happening here in the state of Maine, and I would love to have every mm -hmm. smoke and tobacco-free campus school in the state of Maine featured in our portfolio and then have that be a resource that we can share across the country. Awesome. Great. Um, and so the next one I'll answer was, was regarding that uh, piece, I think, about the smoke-free uh, colleges law was asking, did that did Maine pass the law requiring colleges, campuses to be smoke free? Um, and as Meg mentioned, that uh, that did not have to go through because of the fact that schools voluntarily took that on. Um, one of the nice things in Maine is we've seen a lot of great proactive voluntary work from Maine colleges and universities, um, as well as a lot of other organizations in, in adopting these policies. So the as she mentioned earlier, the sponsor chose to uh, be able to just pull that bill because it was unnecessary at the time and actually served its purpose on showing the fact that um, that you can adopt a policy that that exceeds state law to for your for your campus and I will just add to that too um, as Sarah mentioned in the beginning of the webinar you know we have 22 out of 27 colleges and universities in the state that have smoke and tobacco free campus policies right now and we know of few more of those that are, you know, they're starting to have these conversations on campus. So I would expect in the next couple of years that number will continue to go up. Okay. Exciting. Exactly. That's the exciting part. Um, another one for uh, is, how can I find a policy similar to mine for another school? Do you have copies of policies? That is a great question. We do 
actually have copies of every school in the state. Um, they are, they should all be on our website, which again, that main tobacco free college network.org. And then if you were to just do slash policies, um, it lists all of the colleges and universities in the state of Maine and links to a PDF of their policy. Um, and additionally on our camp, on our website, we have a best practice, you know, absolute pie in the sky. If you're going to pass a policy and can do it as best you can, here's the one to use. You know, this is all encompassing of everything. Mm -hmm. um, so there is access if you wanted to try to find a school similar to yours on our website. All of those are available. Or if you're having trouble identifying a school that might be similar to yours, you know, feel free to reach out to us via email and we can help you with that. Yeah, and then the last question that we have right here is around uh, public right -of -way, public sidewalks or public right-of-ways mm -hmm. that go through your campus. And what advice would you have for a school that might have these roads, um, which I think is a great question. So mm -hmm. we have, I would say, a fair amount of schools <laughs> here in Maine that have this, where there is a town or city-owned road and sidewalk that runs right smack dab through the middle of campus, um, which students are always very good <laughs> at pointing out to say, very hey, quickly. This is not university property, um, to which a lot of schools have said, you know, you're right, technically, no, this is not part of our property, which means the policy may or may not, depending on how it's written and the relationship the school has with that town or municipality, um, probably doesn't cover that, which means technically a student is off campus while on that public right-of-way and could use their tobacco products or smoke in that space. Um, a lot of schools, we've encouraged them to kind of discourage this because, you know, there's a safety perspective of having students standing on the edge of the road um, and smoking, and it doesn't necessarily portray what I think a lot of schools want um, from a, you know, a, a great picture in your community of having students stand there. But um, we have heard a couple of schools that are trying to work with their local municipality to be able to say, you know, this short stretch of this road that runs through our campus, we would like to be able to encourage that to be covered under our smoke and tobacco free campus policy. I don't believe anybody has successfully yet had like a city ordinance or a town ordinance that allows that, but um, for the most part, campus officials and local police kind of just say, you know what? This is for you guys to figure out. We're not going to get in the middle of it. Um, but I also feel like there's the social norming that we've talked about throughout the webinar that for the most part, people aren't going to say, you know, I don't think this road mm -hmm. is owned by the school, so I'm going to go and stand here. You know, the, if they're going to find a way to use tobacco products on campus, they're going to do it on the edge of the campus, in the woods, or out behind a building where nobody sees them uh, to be able to kind of bend the rules that way. Mm -hmm. We haven't heard that it's been a major issue for a lot of yeah. people. Yeah, I think that's a, a great point, Megan. The key that, that it is, as you're stating, that norming component and the fact that we haven't had that follow-up, that it's been an issue. And and the reminder that these policies, while we know that the, the fear is always the long-term enforcement, uh, that it's something, though, it really is changing that norm and knowing that while you might not have everyone uh, from day one completely bought in, the more that you take it seriously, you use that proactive, positive enforcement and awareness um, that that'll have a big impact. Um, and also remembering that uh, every time someone's at least having to maybe go around to the edge of campus or, or behind a building or something and smoking, that's oftentimes something that's going to lead someone towards that road to quit. Um, while these policies really are about the smoke, not the smoker, we know that about 70% or 7 out of 10 tobacco users are somewhere on the stages of change on the readiness to quit. Um, so you want to be having a supportive environment that that encourages that. Um, and so when they're having to go a little further or think about that, that might be, and your policy might be what makes them want to make that change and will help them be successful as well because they're in an environment without those triggers or where it's supportive to stay tobacco free. We'll just give it another yeah. minute and see if there are any other questions that come in. And it doesn't seem like anybody yeah. kind of shows us people are typing. It doesn't seem like anybody is typing. So with that, we will wrap up this webinar. And again, we will send you 
um, the recording link as a registrant so that if you want to share it with any colleagues, you can do that. And again, you can find them on our YouTube channel. And we thank you for joining us today. Thank you.